How involved are the Oklahoma Sooners going to be on the NIL front? We got some big recruiting news trending for the Oklahoma Sooners and could offensive tackle be a problem for Oklahoma in 2023? We'll talk about that on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're free and available on all platforms. Go subscribe to the show over on YouTube. And today's episode is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. Omaha Steaks is a gift from the heart, a gift that will be remembered with every unforgettable bite. Order with complete confidence today, knowing you're ordering the very best. Visit omahasteaks.com. Use promo code Locked On at checkout to get an extra $30 off your order. Again, at omahasteaks.com using promo code Locked On to at Locked On at checkout. I did not freeze. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John Nine Williams. He's Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh On Ref. You can also hear him Monday through Friday from nine to noon on ninety four seven The Ref in Norman. And Josh. I want to open the show with this Josh Pate on the late kick show over at two, four, seven sports and CBS sports had some really interesting comments on NIL versus development and how schools are prioritizing some of this on the recruiting front and what it means for potentially a school like Oklahoma. Estimate. Do you want to go somewhere where you get the immediate money and it's questionable whether you'll get developed or do you want to go to a place that has a long and established track record of developing your position, knowing that number one, your NIL earnings potential is going to peak the moment you step on that campus and especially the moment you play for that team. And number two, there's this other NIL thing. It's called the NFL. Those are the three letters you really need to be concerned about. And some of these programs may not offer you a great big NIL bag before you've played a down for them out of high school. But what they do offer is eventually some lucrative NIL opportunities and NFL opportunities. Now, someone's going to ignorantly come into comments and say, that's foolish. The NFL could find you anywhere. If you can play, the NFL will find you. I never said they wouldn't, friend. There's a big difference in being drafted in the sixth round and late in the first round. And the fact of the matter, and this is inarguable, is the program you go to has a very, very disproportionate impact sometimes on how draftable you end up being. And so, Josh, I just thought that was a a really interesting discussion point because this kind of goes back to our David Hicks discussion from yesterday. How important is NIL to him? How important is development to him? Because we've yet to see Texas A&M really put a strong defensive tackle class into the NFL, whereas a school like Oklahoma, and you could even argue a place like Oregon with defensive coordinator Dan Lanning, there's a track record with Brent Venables, Todd Bates at Oklahoma, with Dan Lanning up at Oregon, with defensive players, with interior defensive line players in particular. But in general, this just seems to kind of be where I feel like Oklahoma's landing on the NIL front. Probably so. Yeah, probably so. And especially out of high school, I think this is where Oklahoma is landing on the NIL front. I think the other question, which, by the way, no surprise, paid state material uh, rant right there and points made. I, I, it's not even really a rant, right? Just points made from Mr. Josh Pate himself. Great show. Uh, great college football voice. It's, uh, you know, it's not a surprise that Oklahoma would take that approach. I, I do think the other element that we have to discuss here is if you are in the business of being the school to where you're picking and choosing one or a couple of players each class that you're giving that big name image likeness deal to what type of culture issues do put perhaps you create on campus if and when said four star five star recruit doesn't turn into said four and five star recruit because look we've we've walked that road here in Norman Oklahoma right where now uh, the last remnants of that trio of five star wide receivers that came to Oklahoma a couple of five star quarterbacks that came to Oklahoma it didn't really work out for any of the five, John. So if you're going to drop this big name image and likeness bag before anybody's really done anything on campus, 
then I think potentially you could walk into some problems right there. So it seems like Oklahoma's approach is to kind of make it more about everybody gets something similar. And you get that when you come to the University of Oklahoma. I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to know the ins and outs of sort of how Oklahoma is operating that or what their plan is going forward. I do think if there was an area to be aggressive with name image likeness, John, to me, it would be, again, transfer portal type players or guys that have already been on your campus for a couple of seasons, like, like Josh Pate talked about, right? That, hey, you come produce and then you can get your name image likeness back later. And it seems to make sense. And again, I think, I don't know, I'm pretty sure Josh stands on the same place as I do where Josh Helmer, not necessarily Josh Pate, not going to speak for him, but that that NIL kind of in the, the purest form can be a really good thing for these athletes where they have an opportunity to kind of earn income off of autograph signings or creating merchandising, things like that. Jersey sales, like all the, the new EA sports, you know, college football, you know, uh, video game that's going to come out in 2024. I think that all creates good opportunities for these kids. It's some of the, Hey, you haven't played a down of college football and we're going to give you a million dollars sort of a thing. Like that's the stuff that I think a lot of people have a, a discomfort with, you know, like, but you know, it, again, if you're a capitalist and the kid is worth that to somebody, then who's, who are we to say he shouldn't get it? But it does create an odd dynamic, you know, like, yes, you were great in high school, but you haven't done anything in college where we've got 90 plus, you know, players who have played in college football that have done something, not getting that kind of, uh, NIL investment, things like that. And so I think the point that, that Pate's making is, is fantastic. And, and this is where I think Oklahoma is going to be okay. Even if they don't become one of the big spenders in NIL, like Texas, like Texas A&M, like Miami, is that they've got a track record of development that they can stand on, especially on the defensive side of the football. Brent Venable's track record of sending, especially defensive linemen, to the NFL. You can even go back to linebackers. You can go to the defensive secondary. That goes back 20-plus years to this point. Like You can go back to the early days of his tenure at Oklahoma. Like You're talking about Roy Williams. You know, Teddy Lehman, like Teddy Lehman was a second round draft pick. Did he, did he have a long lengthy career? Not necessarily, but injuries played a part in that. But Roy Williams did have a long career in the NFL and it was a very successful career uh, until the game became more pass heavy. And it, it just was a little bit more challenging for a guy that was probably would now be like a weak side linebacker in the NFL. So there's a track record that, Hey, if he's out there on the recruiting trail and he's saying, listen, you might be able to go somewhere and get a bigger NIL package from said school, but we can show you the path. If the NFL is your ultimate goal, we can show you a path to get there based on what we've done as a coaching staff at Clemson, at Oklahoma previously. And we feel like we're going to get there with this team as well. And I think it's worth noting also that Oklahoma is trying to be competitive in name image likeness. Now, yeah. Are they going out there trying to drop the maybe Miami money that's out there or big booster rich program money that's out there to every single recruit, every single blue chipper that they're trying to sign in their class? No, I don't think that's Oklahoma's approach on name, image, and likeness. I think uh, it's more an equal across the board approach. And maybe if you've proven something while you're on campus, then that can, uh, that, that can alter – what you get in terms of name image likeness. Maybe it's a little bit performance-based at the University of Oklahoma. But it it probably needs to be said too that while Oklahoma's not going to be, I don't think, Texas or Texas AM, or you know, some some of the numbers you hear from just a bunch of different programs around the country, John, I do think Oklahoma is trying to be more competitive in that space, but maybe just not right at the front of recruitments. And if that's the case, then yes, you do have to. You have to back it up on the fact that you've won football games, which obviously Oklahoma needs to do better than six and six, right? But the, the coaching staff, their track records, the guys that they have sent to the National Football League, you're selling on that. And I don't think every single recruit, even though we live in this world where you got four stars and five stars and different uh, recruits that they're getting who knows what amount, right? We hear different amounts, but some of that's not totally verified out there what different blue chippers are getting. In a world where you're getting that, I don't think every single recruit 
sees or wants that, John. I do think they see a little bit about what Josh Pate is talking about, which is the end of the road cash, right? The after I develop cash, the if I produce at the University of Oklahoma, oh, here's what's in store for me in terms of name, image, and likeness. And then again, the 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 all important three letters, the NFL. Can you get me there? Can you keep me there? Can I get a second, third contract once I get there? Yeah, and the 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 end of that being Brent Venables has said, if NIL is a number one priority for you, we're probably not the the best place for you because it's going to be more than that at the University of Oklahoma. They want to develop you not just as a player, but as a person, the holistic approach to person development and player development. And yeah, NIL is going to be a part of it. Oklahoma is going to be a part of of the NIL sphere, the atmosphere. But again, I I don't think it's going to be one of those things that's the, the big selling point on why they get recruits to come to Norman to play football. And coming up after the break, after Josh talks to you about Omaha Steaks, we're going to talk about an Oklahoma trend toward a particular player that might land with them. That was a terrible segue, but go ahead, Josh. Well, what's not a terrible segue to get good grace from your friends, your family, your loved ones, or who knows, maybe uh, maybe you're like me and you feel like being a little greedy this Christmas and, uh, I don't know, being a Grinch for yourself in a positive way, right? Get yourself some Omaha steaks. I love, man, a good steak. Uh, big filet mignon guy right here, but I'll eat just about any sort of steak that you give me. Eh, generally speaking, I'm kind of of the, the medium rare, but if you, you cook it medium, you, you can talk me into that. Omaha steaks, though, you're looking for the right gift. You can't go wrong. Holidays, obviously, are here. You're running out of time to get that gifting greatness, but you can get that accomplished with the gift of perfectly aged, tender, and delicious Omaha steaks. The steak experts over at Omaha Steaks, they've put together this special curated gift package for you to, again, take the guesswork out of it and make you a holiday hero. So go on over to omahasteaks.com. Use our code locked on at checkout to get $30 off your order. That's our code locked on at checkout to get $30 off your order. So the Oklahoma Sooners received three projections on the recruiting trail for 2023 four-star edge slash linebacker Talsili Akana out of Utah. They got the fong. They got fonged. Steve Wilt fong 247 sports dropped a crystal ball favoring Oklahoma. Brandon drum of OU insider at 247 sports also dropped a crystal ball. And then Josh McQuistian of sooner scoop at rivals dropped a rivals future cast favoring the Oklahoma Sooners landing to Celia Kana. This is one day after the Sooners got commitments from Deshaun McCullough from Indiana, the transfer portal acquisition, and then his little brother, Day McCullough. I say little brother. These guys aren't little at all. Day McCullough, the 2023 four-star safety. So Oklahoma's training in the right direction, but on Akana specifically, this is huge news for the Sooners. Absolutely. He's uh, kind of in that linebacker edge range, uh, you know, probably fits more your traditional edge rush type, John. But, uh, I mean, just judging by the way that 247 Sports has him listed here, I don't know that you just put Desilia Akana into just that one box. Probably he would have the opportunity if uh, the coaching staff feels that way to develop into a linebacker. 6'4", 225, I mean, that sounds like linebacker uh, size and and weight to me, right? But you could also put – you know, 30, 40 pounds on and turn that into your traditional edge. So I think he's somebody that uh, could do multiple things at the University of Oklahoma. Big recruiting win if this takes place, John. The the other names, according to 247 Sports, that are on the short list for Akana, LSU, Texas, Texas A&M, Tennessee, which a couple of big money bag programs, we think, right, in terms of name, image, likeness, speak of the devil on that list. And this shows – if it comes to fruition that you can still win blue chip wars. I mean, you're a kind of the number 34 player nationally, according to 24 seven sports, he's the number four edge rusher, obviously top player from Utah. If you're more interested in what a composite ranking looks like a lot of people, John like to look at that just because it's, Hey, it's not partial to 24 seven sports. It's not partial to rivals. It's not partial to on three. It encompasses all of them. The two, four, seven sports composite is still a top 100 player naturally for your top 16 edge. So big time talent would be a huge get for Oklahoma coming down the stretch, which 
this shouldn't be a surprise, right? It shouldn't be any sort of a shock that Oklahoma's closing like this. We've already seen this once for this coaching staff. They're going to get talent on campus. It's going to be about can they develop said talent and put guys in the right spots to be successful. I still think Brett Venables and this coaching staff is going to get that accomplished before it's all said and done, uh, said and done, John. But we just got to be patient with that. In Akana, another example of that. And I think it says something that Brent Venables is at the forefront of this recruitment. Like this is a dude he really wants to be in Norman. Your, your head coach isn't often the guy that 247 Sports is listing as the primary recruiter. Usually it's the defensive coordinator or a position coach. But with Brent Venables, I mean, he's after Akana, he's after him bad. If they're able to land them, I think that that is a, a huge win for Oklahoma. Again, you know, the difference between a four star and a five star often can just simply be talent. It can be, you know, exposure. I say talent. I say exposure, talent. It could just be the level of competition they play against. And were Akana playing in Texas, Class 6A, could he be a five-star? Potentially. I mean, this is a dude that's got a lot of good tools. You know, he is a, a tall edge rusher, but he's also a guy that's quick off the ball. He's somebody that closes really well. He's got good pass set skill or pass rush skills, developed, well-developed pass rush skills. So I think this is going to be, I mean, if Steve Wolfong is saying it, Brandon Drum, Josh McQuistian, you can almost pretty much put this one in the bag that this one is going to happen for the Oklahoma Sooners. Now, there's always you know last minute pushes that could change things, but this late into the cycle, I don't think we'd see these this many projections favoring Oklahoma if that wasn't real. You know what I mean? Like if this were a year ago and we're seeing these projections, okay, you might have some reason to kind of have a little bit of caution with how much optimism you put into those projections. But I mean, we're just what eight days from the beginning of the early signing period. We're less than two months away from national signing day. Now's the time to kind of like put up or shut up a little bit on the recruiting trail. It's time to put up or shut up with the things that you're telling these teams. Like if you're legit really favoring these teams, like you don't really have much time to kind of flip that, that opinion on that. So uh, Oklahoma is going to finish strong. Like they, they, I still go back to what they did at the end of the 2022 cycle. They had less than two months to put that class together and they built it from a number 28 class after everybody decommitted and flipped from the Lincoln Riley 2022 recruiting class. They pushed it all the way to number eight in the nation, getting guys like R Mason Thomas, getting a guy like Grayson Halton to flip, getting a guy like, you know, Alton Tar, uh, Alton Tarver, getting a guy like Kevonte Henry. Yeah. Those, you know, two of those guys, they ended up moving on to in the transfer portal to other places, but our Mason Thomas is going to be a big time player for you. That's just, that's the fact Grayson Halton. He's going to be a big time player for you. I think those two guys are going to be huge and they were last minute flips for the Oklahoma listeners. So they're going to finish strong. We're already seeing it with the McCullough brother commitments. We're going to see it with Akana and who knows? I mean, Again, still trending in the right direction on Peyton Bowen. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. And then who knows where this is going to land with David Hicks. I think Oklahoma fans are starting to temper their expectations a little bit, which is probably a safe thing to do. But I wouldn't count out Brent Venables. I wouldn't count out Todd Bates until he puts pen to paper and signs with either Texas A&M or Oregon. I said this uh, the other day, John, and just for our new listeners or viewers on the YouTube side, I don't think because Tarber or Henry or even Evers is somebody that obviously was a late ad for Oklahoma that now all of a sudden they're in the transfer portal. They're going elsewhere, which Nick Evers, we can talk about the Wisconsin fit. If you're interested in that, uh, that's kind of a interesting spot. I think for him with, uh, with coach fickle and what maybe they're going to be able to do going forward. But just because those didn't work, John, I think that, there's been a little discussion out there about, oh, the late flips or the late ads to a class. Man, I, I still think that, you know, somebody like an Akana or Bowen or whoever, I don't know that just because it didn't work out with some names from last year's signing class that that scares me off from future signing classes. Obviously, you're always going to keep trying to add talent to a class, but I'm just saying for anybody else out there that maybe would have any sort of pessimism or – fears that these late ads aren't going to stick around and be longtime Sooners and work out at Oklahoma. I don't know that those track records for Tarber and Henry particularly mean that that's not going to be the case for somebody like in Akana or a Bowen, if you flip him. Right. I, so keep recruiting these guys and get these final blue chippers in. And you know, somebody like uh, a Jaron Canick, I think has a super bright future 
at the University of Oklahoma. And that's not somebody that was along for the whole ride of last recruiting class, John. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. You're not going to continue. You're not going to stop trying to flip kids late again just because it didn't work out. You can't anticipate that players are going to be dissatisfied with either a lack of opportunity or with the direction that you're going at a position or just that they weren't fits. Like they got to campus and realized maybe they weren't a fit in your program. You, you can't anticipate some of those things. Some of those things are out of your control. Some of them are in your control. Like, you know, maybe potentially playing Nick Evers against Texas. That's in your control. You could have done that, but you can't control how he feels about any of that. That's, that's all up to him. That's how he feels about it. You can't make him feel any other way about it. So, I mean, again, the Alton's Harbor thing, I think there would have been an opportunity for playing time for him if he had stuck it out with Oklahoma. But maybe he saw the writing on the wall too with a guy like David Hicks, a guy like David Stone, with Derek LeBlanc coming to town. Maybe he just decided like, hey, I'm not going to really get much playing time here with you know, Ashton Sanders as well. Like Again, big Ashton Sanders fan over here. So you can't control all of the different uh, elements of a player and what they're thinking about their situation. You can only you know, try to do your best at developing said player and getting them kind of ready to play, getting them ready for the next season or trying to get them to the next level. Uh, so speaking of the next level, the Oklahoma Sooners are losing two offensive tackles to the NFL draft. What's that mean for the 2023 offensive line? We'll talk about that after the break. First, I want to talk to you about Bet Bet BetOnline is your number one source for sports betting info, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to college bowl season to basketball and the World Cup. We got it all at Bet Online. If you love sports, you can find everything you need from MMA to boxing at Bet Online. The line for the Oklahoma Sooners in the Cheez It Bowl against Florida State. The Sooners right now are minus seven and a half point underdogs. With Dylan Gabriel at the helm, they only lost, well, really didn't really lose because Dylan Gabriel didn't play the whole game against TCU, but they played close games throughout. So that you know, that Oklahoma plus seven and a half is looking pretty nice if you want to get in on the action over at Bet Online against Florida State for the Cheez It Bowl. Bet Online is again the fastest and the easiest place to place all your bets, and Bet Online is where the game starts. All right, Josh, Anton Harrison, we, we knew this was probably going to happen just with the season he had. Now, a two year starter for the Oklahoma Sooners, Wanye Morris. Heading to the NFL, Wanye looks like he'll be playing in the Senior Bowl. You're losing your starting offensive tackles. You got guys like Tyler Guyton, J- Jacob Sexton, Jake Taylor waiting in the wings. What does this mean for Oklahoma's offensive line? I, I don't know if we're talking enough about how potentially huge those losses are. Gigantic. Yeah, gigantic. And this is the case in college football. You're going to have turnover, turnover and – you hope those guys behind the said turnover are ready to go be stars or NFL guys in their own right. And we'll see. Jacob Sexton is somebody that at least going into the Texas tech game was second on the depth chart at left tackle. You've got a redshirt sophomore in Aaron parks. That was third there on the depth chart behind Anton Harrison. So definitely for somebody like Jacob Sexton, where we've had so much hype, so much hope there, Big leap, right, from year one to year two. You need that. Savion Bird feels like a young offensive lineman, John, for this program. Redshirt freshman right now will be a obviously a redshirt sophomore next year. He was in that or situation at left guard going into Texas Tech. Kind of feels like he could play all over for OU. I know that they, you know, right now have him on the inside, but I don't think it's, you know, he's not the 6'6", 3'12", that Jacob Sexton is or the 6'7", 3'20" that Tyler Guyton is, but I think if they found that Savion Bird was their best option at either left or right tackle, I don't think that's off the table for him being 6'5", 3'10". So those names, those three right there, need to take big progressions forward. Jake Taylor, another name I think folks can be excited about. But uh, those guys, I think in-house, John, first and foremost, need to really, really take a big jump. And who knows? I, I the, the coaching staff – in a couple of these cases, might have felt like it wasn't that far off from a Guyton or from a Taylor or from a Sexton being able to go out there and make plays and be a significant contributor on the offensive line for this team, John. I don't know the truth serum answer to that for any of those three, but obviously you got to have all of those guys make big jumps. And then I do think it's vital 
that Oklahoma winds up with a, at least a couple of guys offensive line out of the transfer portal, whether or not those guys wind up being definite starters for you or complete difference makers. I think just from a depth standpoint, somebody that has bona fide production already at the collegiate level would be huge. A la a McCade Mathire, a la one of the guys we're talking about in Wanye Morris. Yeah. And it's what we talk about every time we bring up the transfer portal is finding guys that give you a safe floor and hoping that either they or one of your younger guys on the depth chart, take that floor and raise it and create a higher ceiling for you. We're going to find out. I think we're, I mean, we're going to find out about what your offensive tackle depth looks like pretty quickly in the cheese it bowl when, you know, you probably are going to start Tyler Guyton at right tackle. And then it's probably going to be either Aaron parks or uh, Jacob Sexton at left tackle. You might even see some Jake Taylor out there as well. I, I hope that they take this opportunity to play a lot of guys at the tackle position. Do you want to win the game? Absolutely. That's, that's key. That's huge. Want to avoid the losing season at the same time. It's a prime opportunity to see what your offensive tackles have against what is one of the better pass rushers in the, in college football, a guy that's got strong NFL prospects and Jared verse who had seven and a half sacks. So take the opportunity, play as many guys as you can, or at least as many guys as you feel comfortable playing and just give them those snaps. Let them learn a little bit under fire. You know, if you have to rotate a couple guys at one of the tackle positions or and then give Tyler Guyton all the snaps at right tackle to start getting him ready, because I thought he did play good when we when we saw him play in 2022 and spot starts for Wanya Morris. I thought he played well and you didn't know there wasn't a big noticeable difference between the two. I mean, if I'm Bill Beatenbow, maybe I can sit here and hammer out the note the differences between the two and you know, maybe how Wanya played better than Tyler Guyton, but I think just from a 20,000 foot perspective, they looked, I mean, Tyler Guyton didn't look too far off. So it gives me some hope for next year that you got Tyler Guyton. He's going to be able to step in and play right tackle for you. The big question is going to be left tackle, uh, but you got plenty of time to figure that out. You got opportunities to improve your depth or at least improve your overall, overall talent through the transfer portal. Last thing we're going to touch on. And again, we, we feel like we have, you know, it's so hard to touch on this because, what's the right way to talk about a, a guy that impacted college football to the extent that Mike Leach impacted college football? What's the, the right way to honor someone who is probably as beloved a figure in college football as maybe we've seen in the last 20, 30 years. Um, somebody who kind of did things his own way. And that's kind of the the big takeaway from Michael Leach's life. There's so many things that you could point to, but that's the thing that really stands out to me in a, in a world like college football that is so buttoned up, you know, it's so much an old boys club from the presidents to the athletic directors, to the coaches way, you know, sometimes the way um, coaching decisions are done, it's very much relational and it's, you know, about how you kind of how you're perceived a lot of times, like you're, you're an ambassador for the school. Well, Mike Leach decided, you know, during his tenure at Texas tech and probably earlier than that, that he was just going to be himself. He wasn't going to conform to the way that everybody perceives a college football coach should be. And, and that's, that's what made him so beloved is that he was real and he was authentic and it wasn't always about football. Like he had other interests. And I think that's, there's something beautiful to that in a world where sports, youth sports in particular has become such a, a crazy uh, element in the fabric of our society that Mike Leach really showed like, Hey, there's more to life than this sometimes. And it's, it's hard for us to, to talk about that, especially being a sports show, like there's more to life than sports sometimes. Like there's, there's other things that you can be interested in that go beyond sports. And it's a good thing to have very, you know, varied interests that kind of can take your mind off of even something that you love. You need a break from it sometimes, you know, and, and you might need to focus on something else. And, and I think that's, that's one of the great things that Mike Leach provided and his passing is way too soon. And, and it's, it, it's been hard to kind of like really wrap your mind around being 61. Like that's my parents' age. You know, my dad is 61 years old and my dad had heart surgery 10 years ago. So like, or nine years ago, no, 11 years ago. Um, and so knowing like, yeah, we, we don't know the days we don't know, you know, 
nobody knows the days that we have with the people that we love. And so just, just all that to say, like, live your life. You know, if you don't, don't necessarily conform, you know, like if you feel like who you are is what you need to be, then just be that and do it your way. And Lo, you know, spend as many days and cherish as many days as you can with your loved ones. I said a lot of the same things on the radio side earlier today that it was Mike Leach's authentically unique self that was so beautiful about him and that endeared so many to him. And I think the way that you touched on that is, right on the money. That's exactly how I feel about it. He wasn't afraid to be himself. And the other point you touched on not conforming right to being a cookie cutter version of what we see from every assistant coach, every head coach. I mean, he was himself, right? He was fun. He made college football fun. And all of this, you know, shouldn't ignore the fact either that the guy was a heck of a football coach. He was an incredible football coach. He won at places that a lot of people typically don't win. And not that he went and was rattling off national championships, though he did with uh, Crabtree and company have Texas Tech not too far away from that very territory of fighting for a national championship. But, man, at places that historically – didn't year in and year out win eight, nine games. Generally speaking, typically Mike Leach was doing that. So phenomenal football coach. I don't think he was always just the charismatic in front of the camera guy. I mean, I think at times he could be legitimately a hard-nosed football coach, right? But he was just obviously so unique and peculiar, beautifully peculiar. And uh, it is it is a nice reminder, I think, to everybody to, it's okay to be yourself, right? You don't have to be what uh you know within within limits right it's okay to be maybe not the same as everybody in your profession maybe a little bit different uh just walk your walk of life the way that you want to walk it and obviously mike leach was a great example of that ton of uh ton of success at the university of oklahoma i thought bob stoops's comments today uh on our radio st- radio station were awesome talking about mike leach so if you haven't you know, heard those, go check those out at uh, KREF.com and just click the little podcast link. Mike Leach was a different bird, man. He was a different bird. And we should be very, very thankful as sports fans that he entertained us for as long as he did. And you can't watch college football without seeing Mike Leach's fingerprints on it. The evolution and revolution that was the air raid is all over college football. It's all, all over the NFL, high school. I mean, it, it revolutionized the game and you just look at the, the list of coaches that come out of his coaching tree and you can't help, but be somewhat in awe of the, the many, many coaches that were part of who he was as a coach. And so the, the legacy will live on, you know, and he's one of those guys that, that will continue to have an impact on the game long, you know, long now after he's gone. And so, uh, again, you know, prayers out to, you know, Mike Leach's family, his friends, um, you know, the Mississippi state community, Texas tech community, Washington state community, and the Oklahoma Sooners community as well, who all were directly impacted by his presence in their respective cities and respective college towns. Um, uh, but again, to so many who, you know, had interactions and had the opportunity to know him personally, um, our, our thoughts and our prayers go out to you as well. And, um, and that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Again, thanks so much for tuning into the show and subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again to Josh Pate for allowing us to use that clip from his show. Make sure you go check out the Late Kick show as well. Uh, now that you're done listening to Locked On Sooners, go check out one of the, another great Locked On podcast. Uh, go check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast with Peter Rakowski, giving you the latest in college or really just all of sports in under 20 minutes. Uh, but until next time, He's Josh Helmer. I'm John Williams. We'll catch you then. Boomer Sooner.